Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome, all, welcome you all to the third webinar in the um, series of four webinars. Our, our last webinar is on the 26th of April. Um, but today, we're very lucky to be joined by um, uh, Cameron Gibson. Um, he's a farmer near Ralston in Fitzroy, Fitzroy Basin in our region. He's going to talk to us about, uh, I guess, his um, involvement in, a, in the land restoration um, fund and because he was involved in the initial pilot program. So, uh, but before I do that, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today uh, and recognise their continuing con connection to land, water and community. Um, and I'd also like to honour elders past, present and emerging. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the Queensland Government um, and we appreciate uh, the opportunity to um, or the funding to uh, basically essentially build this uh, stronger network of uh, knowledge brokers in carbon farming in particular um, building their knowledge around the land restoration fund too and so we thank thank you for your uh, support with that. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Louise Gavin who's our facilitator as you can see on screen uh, John Gavin, is he online? I'm not sure. Yes, he is. Welcome, John. Um, he's a bit of an expert in, in carbon farming, so he's helping us in the project. And uh, also uh, Tom Webster from DES and, uh, and your team there also. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chris Norman, the CEO of NRM Regions Queensland, who I think is online. Uh, if not, he will be soon. Uh, so we're working together on, a, on this uh, knowledge broking, uh, building the knowledge broker base uh, of uh, people involved in carbon farming. So we've got a project that, that's um, running till uh, July or June this stage. Uh, June. And uh, yeah, so we've part of this is uh, four webinars. We've also built, um, developed some uh, resources uh, which are online on the QFF website and the Queensland you know, Regions uh, website also. And uh, yeah, so no, it's going quite well. And uh, again, thank you for your time. Um, so a bit of housekeeping uh, for, please stay on mute, um, but we really do enjoy the, uh, the thumbs up and the, the raising your hands and, and whatever else you can do with the buttons. Um, please, please don't stop the webinar, that'd be my only. <laughs> I don't think you've got the power to do that, but, uh, uh, and also the chat box. So um, you might like to say hello uh, where, you, where you're from um, and uh, feel free to post your questions to Cameron um, through the chat box. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, um, so you're aware, uh, and it will be available on the QFF uh, website and the NRM Regions uh, Queensland website. Uh, probably before Easter at this stage. Uh, and th this webinar, it's focused on upskilling those working with landholders to involve them in carbon farming. Um, so uh, this is just the, the third in a series of four. Um, and it, basically the format for today is that Cameron will speak uh, for about maybe roughly half an hour. Uh, and then we'll use the remaining time for questions. So. I'll, uh, as, as I said before, um, I'll welcome Cameron um, and uh, would like to hear his story and because and he's, he's learned a few things about carbon farming along the way and I think he's, he's uh, I've heard Cameron talk before and um, I'm sure he can do it again and I, I hope you all enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll hand over to Cameron unless you've got anything to say, Louise. No, Cameron. Cameron, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just go straight into it. Let me share and bring this up. Um, right, yes, yeah, so hi all, it's a bit different. I've, this is the second time I've spoken into a computer, so please bear with me. It's a bit different when you just look at the green light instead of actually being able to judge and, and talk to an audience. Um, so, yeah, so uh, this, that's our family and I'll just go sort of straight into our story. So, 
some of the things I'll talk about today is just our story. So I'll go through where we started, when we started and what we've done and what we're doing today. I'll go into then about the benefits that you can count. So the landowner themselves, or you can go out, just some of the things you can start looking at. And then Louise has spoken to me about the beef herd, herd methodology and, and ultimately it comes back to changing your practice. So I'll just show you what we have done or explain to you what we have done and how we've changed our system. And I've got some results and some figures here that I can put, bring up at the end. And then the, the last point there is just, is just the areas to investigate more and who you should talk to or who you should trust um, to keep going down and keep investigating this path. This path will work for some and it will not work for others. So, you know, you just got to be honest to yourself and, um, and, and keep working forward with it until it gets to that point where it's a yes or a no. Um, so, Kurnaba was purchased by us, by our family in 1988. Um, that's an aerial photograph of Kurnaba and the, the map is the property map of when we bought the place. So, it was two paddocks, one 10,000 acre paddock at the back, which we see there with lot three, and then it was a 7,000 acre paddock in the front, lot one. So when mum and dad purchased Coonaba, they intended to set it up as a continuous grazing system. So large paddocks and small numbers of cattle. Um, so where we are today, so sorry, but part of the story in 1992, my parents attended the Grazing for Profit School hosted by RCS or Resource Consultancy Service. During that, during that week, um, they had their paradigms challenged. And that's when, once our paradigms were challenged, and once we accepted to challenge our paradigms, that's when opportunities arose. So that photo there was taken in 2015. Um, Curtis of Qantas, we were flying home, my wife and I were flying home one day, and yeah, that's, that's Kurnabar at, at 19,000 feet. Um, so it sort of stands out a little bit, and I'll explain more um, the photo as we go through. So, the one on your right is Coonabar from 1988. And the one on your left is Coonabar. That's an old map as of today. So that map was probably done in about 2014. So a lot of this back country here now, we are splitting that up again now. So we have 86 paddocks in the front. And once we've finished our development out here in the back, we're going to have approximately another 70 to, to 80 paddocks in the back. And that's going to be a slightly different rotation system as in that we'll be having a, a three day graze period there. Where in the front here, these paddocks are 25 hectares and it's generally a thousand LSU in there. So it's generally just on a, a day or 24 hour rotation. Um, so this is just some other photos, obviously, that we've got over the time. And this is what we've done. So we've cleared our paddocks now in strips. So we've applied grasslands. We've applied it in 40 metres. We've left 40 metres and applied it again in 40 metres. With how the grassland chemical, with how that works through encroachment, it's ended up clearing approximately 50 metres of, of strip and leaving approximately 30 metres of, of timber. Um, and this photo here, back at the very start, you could actually see this dam here in that 1988 photo. So when you do put the two side by side, it's, it's quite amazing the difference um, within that. And that's just the second photo, obviously, is just, you know, a little bit further down, um, similar paddocks. One of the things, though, that we'd have changed from that is when we first applied grasslands in that way. Um, Grasslands changed it. Instead of us going in that square pattern, you'll see it later. There's a big, long, straight runs. Um, they wanted us to pay an extra 10% to apply it in the square pattern or that charge us less if we applied it in the big, long, straight runs, which is what we've done, as you can see there. Um, so that's our front country here, which is a lot of... 95% of our front country is Brigolo, um, the threatened species, and then we've got a lot of box country through here as well. Um, but you can see the difference there from our place compared to our neighbours of just the, the diversity now that we have um, 
and within the last six years, it's still amazing how many the tree, how much the trees have grown. And I'll show you figures at the end of how our production, even through the dry times, was down, but yet our profit was still high. So the benefits that you can count. Um, so this is where we need a baseline. So what we need to do for the start of any LRF project is you need a baseline. So the easiest way today is everybody carries within their pocket pretty well is their phone. And it's a way that you can go through your property, you can take photos of what you have in your paddocks, which is a start to recording. Because one of the key components within the LRF carbon credit system, the co-benefit system is on that third line there is its additionality. So, um, so to go, sorry, I'll just skip a bit. Um, so the great thing with the LRF carbon credit system here scheme, co-benefit scheme is that you can get paid to implement changes that will benefit your business. Um, so if you're starting from a bare block or from a zero block, these benefits, they will, honestly, from what we've learned, they're, they're going to be huge. Um, and I was, no, I've said it before, but you'll really be highlighted at the end. And you get paid to put those fences up. Where we went through it, we saw the benefit, we understood the benefit, we went and paid those costs ourselves. That's fine. We're happy with that. Um, and now we're trying to find a way of actually promoting and using, and even for us, actually getting a little bit of equity back with this. The more threatened the ecosystem or the more endangered species that you have on your price, the potential, the benefit, the higher the co-benefit payment may be. So if you're talking to anyone who wants to look into it, this scheme is a nice scheme. Um, however, it's only a small part of it. You, by changing your grazing practices, you'll probably get a bigger bang for your buck by changing your practices. And this is a nice little cream on the crop, you could say. So through the beef herd methodology and changing your practices, um, we at Canberra, we'd already seen and heard the improvement in production that, and the environmental benefits that can be had, that you can receive by changing your system. And I'll have a short video soon that will show you that. So with regards to straight off the MLO website, I, I just did a quick Google and just look for those three dot points, you know, or what is changing your beef herd methodology? What's it all about? So it's reducing the average age of your herd. It's reducing the proportion of unproductive animals in your herd. And it's also changing the ratio of livestock classes to increase the total annual live weight gain of your herd. So there are three pretty simple systems that can be done. Um, and I'll just show you and I'll highlight that with this video. So just a short clip, this video was taken in 2020, January 2020. Um, and I'll just sort of show you that by changing our grazing system within a 14 day period, you'll see where our grass went to. So I'll just press play on this and, um, and just watch where it goes. Morning, uh, here on Coonabar, I'll just down on planet B on Coonabar. Um, we've just moved our cattle into this paddock here behind me, planet B1. Uh, for our area here, we're a 650 mil average. For the last 12 months, our total has been 235 mil. Last night, we received 37 mil, so that takes us to a total of 272 mil for 12 months. Uh, and we're just going to document our cell here over the next eight days. As we move cattle through that, we'll take some photos just to see the response that we get from, from the rain that we've had. Now, we'll talk soon. Bye. Sorry. Hello, here I am at Planet B1 again. Uh, this is five days after 37 mils of rain and four days after cattle have moved out of the paddock. So the turnaround have come down now. You see the response that we're starting to get. 
tree, our paddock. Here I am on the planet B2, B1 fence. I'm looking in B2 at the moment, panning around. I'll have to go back and check my other videos of how many days ago those cattle were in that paddock, but I believe it was about four or five days ago. They're coming into planet B1. That's the difference. Here I am at planet B1. Jack and I are about to move the cattle. Uh, over the last 14 days we have had 75 millimetres of rain. This is the response. The cattle have been out of this paddock for 13 days. Uh, just as a reference, one of my working dogs there. Behind the grass, you can see the response that we've had over time. So, from that short video, sort of what I was trying and what I wanted to highlight was that, you know, whilst the LRF component and the, and the payment for carbon credits um, is is a nice, it's a little it's a little payment when it comes to the end of the day, where if you can have grass in your paddocks and if you can look after your country so it's always rain ready, that's the biggest bang for the buck that you can have. So as you can see. Um, in January 2020, we had approximately 520 head within that cell mob there, and that we had an average, um, our total LSU on the place was below a thousand. So you can see that by looking after a country and by selling cattle early and having our country raid ready, within 14 days, we had uh, a foot of grass. Within a month, you lost the motorbike in that paddock. I did go back, but I haven't got the photo to put in there. The, mo the grass was as high as a four-wheel motorbike. So the only part that I could see on the motorbike was we have a little milk crate on the front of the bike, and that's the only part that we could see. So within a month of that rainfall, we, were, we would have had the ability to put two and a half to three and a half thousand head of cattle back on Coonabar. Um, we chose not to, we chose to maintain a, a low stocking rate at that point in time because we didn't know where we were going to go. And being honest, it was probably a good thing that we did that because the way 2020 panned out, it turned out to be quite dry as well. Um, and then that set us up again for this current rainfall event now. So I've been out, I had some QUT guys here yesterday and we're looking at doing some soil carbon uh, monitoring with, with some towers and some different things. And the gentleman that came out, he sort of said that he believes we would have seven tonne of grass per hectare across our place at the moment. Um, that was just, he said, just based on, on the current photo, you know, the, the photo books, the photo logs of, of estimated dry matter across your area, he believed that would be a seven tonne. Um, and then so going into this slide here, so to go back uh, approximately five, six years, I can't remember the exact date, unless I looked at the photo, but that says it all. So we had 2,005 head in that paddock there, and that paddock follows those bear, that, that fence. So that fence goes to that high timber line you can see at the back, comes across, and there's a bit, there is a corner to this high timber line, and it comes in there. So we had 2,005 2, head in 13 hectares for 24 hours. So we had enough grass, we had and our water was, was good enough that we had the ability to keep those cattle in there for that period of time. And they would have been a 320 kilo average mob. You know, their LSU would have been, they would have been about an average live weight of 320 kilos. So by looking after your grass, your grass will look after you back uh, afterwards. So the lead up to that video, this was March 2019. Um, that's a young fellow we had working for us, that's Travis. Travis is approximately uh, just off 180, 185, 190 centimetres tall. So, and that's approximately 50 metres away from a water point. So there is a mob of cattle there that you can't quite see. It's just in off his shoulder there. 
you know, that's how high the grass is, um, 50 metres away from a water point. So within our system, our cattle only graze that paddock approximately four or five days of the year. So the rest of it is spending that 360-ish days rested, growing, ready to go again. Um, the slide in the middle, you can see that was after rainfall. And that's personally what I love to see. It's the cattle are in there, they're eating what they eat, but then they also turn the rest over and lay it in. So that through the, the wet ground and the trample effect, you know, you're getting that six foot grass there, you know, anywhere from four to six foot grass. They lay on it, they sit in it, they, um, they walk it over, then they push it into your soil. And it's just amazing. Once you get that next little bit of follow up rain, how far that paddock and how quickly that paddock responds is amazing. So yeah, that's obviously a grazed paddock. And on the other side of the fence is the paddock that they would have went to within, um, uh, within four or five days. And you know, that's just another paddock out the car window, as you can see, you know, looking across that 320 kilogram mob average. And yet again, you can't see them for the grass. You know, and that was that, so yet again, we'd had 234 mils for 12 months. And then for March alone, we had another 124 mil. You know, so um, by the time that whole rolling rainfall average would have worked out, you know, we might have come back to, by the end of March, we may have come back to a, a give or take of 300, 320 mil rolling total. And so for a 650 mil area, that's, that's what you can produce if you look after your country. So if you match your stocking rate, if you meet your carrying capacity, so if your stocking rate matches your carrying capacity, and if you follow that in, and that does, it, it ebbs and flows, it's up and down throughout the years, um, that's the grass that you can have. And as I was saying before, one of our mottos is here, is that we need grass to have cattle, we need cattle to have production, we need production to have income. Sorry, I just went too far. Um, so this is some stuff that we've just finished with RCS. We're doing a case study um, with them at the moment within our whole grazing system. And so some of the things here that I want to highlight are on the side here. Um, so I'm pretty happy with our roam, with where our current land values are. You know, our roam over this seven year average has been 2.4%. So we do have more figures for that. However, we changed our business enterprise in 2007. So we went from a breeding and fattening operation to 2007, we went into a trading operation. So we work purely on the KLR marketing principles. We have a spreadsheet that we put figures in. So we put our sale value in of a live weight of uh, your dollars per kilo. And then you go through and you look at your different animals and you put in your purchase weights and your purchase price. You have your costs and everything else associated. So we know our freight from Charter Stairs, from Longreach, from Emerald, from Gracemere. You know, we've got different areas there that we know where we source cattle from. It puts it in that, it takes all emotion out of it and it tells you whether there's a profit or a loss. So obviously if there's a profit, you want to see where you want to go, You're yes or a no. You know, if you want more profit, less profit, it depends on what you want to do there. But if it's a loss, you say no. So you can leave those cattle where they are. So I can do that when I'm on the phone to the agent. Then and there I'll say, yes, I'm interested to talk more or so I might not, they're too good for me. Thank you for your time. We'll talk again later. Um, so some of the, the big figures here is our EBIT. So EBIT here stands for earnings before income tax. And that brings it back down to your dollar per hectare average. So our average is $33 per hectare. Industry average over the same seven years that we did it was $14. So I was very cautious to make sure that, you know, I didn't include any more years that the years that we didn't do a profit probe, they were not being included because it's, you know, that's not fair on them. So I wanted to compare each year for against the industry average. So our meat production, as you can see, is 37 kilograms per hectare against an industry average of 38.6. So here, what I wanted to highlight is 2009. We only had 21 kilograms production for 2009, team, sorry. To go back, if I could repeat any year, I would repeat 2007, 2008. So we had a production of 69 kilograms per hectare. 
Um, and that will come through at the end as well. So cost of production um, is $1.52 versus industry average of $1.22. I'm okay with that. Yes, we're above, it's costs us more, but as well though our operation is slightly different is because we are trading operations. So we have a lot higher freight costs. We have a lot more commission we pay. There's a lot of other costs that are associated with that. And as you can see in 2019, our figures again, our dollars, it was nearly, it was a dollar higher than industry average. That's okay, because it's gonna, when I get to the figure, this next figure here, this is what it comes back to me, is your gross margins per LSU. So 2013, for as little cattle as we ran, we still had a profit of $234 gross margin per LSU versus the industry average of 163. And as I said, if, if I could repeat any year, I'd go back to 2008. So if you look at our $303 gross margin versus $72. So this enables us and it highlights to me that even though our production was below half of the industry average, our profit was well above the industry average. And it's by changing our system, it was by having, having our country rain ready so that we had the ability once it rained or once we got that break in the season that we needed, our system kicked into gear. Um, our grass grew, our cattle then, therefore then we started to get production back, therefore everything started to roll again and everything started to move forward again. Um, and so we're still going through with RCS and we're still tidying this up and um, we're going to do a case study and put a case study out on that um, in the near future. Cameron, can I, inter can I interrupt something there? Yes, we've, had a, yes. we've had a question come in. Um, so besides carbon improvements, what other soil improvements have you measured? So have you been able to measure infiltration rates or bulk density? Like, So have you worked out the increase of water holding capacity? Anything in that range? Uh, no, we... We haven't, we're about to. So these soil carbon guys that are here setting up the tear, we will start having information with that. Good. But the only thing I can say on that is, is what I have visually seen. Um, we need over 75 mils overnight before we run water, before we put any water in our dams. So even the other night we had a storm of 75 mil um, and we only put a metre in our dam. So it's, Good that's, yeah, so that's what it's telling me. And when you go down, and I do have some slides and videos of stuff that we, um, 2016, we, we've got some photos there of where, you know, I can't remember the exact LSU without pulling up that, I've done a photo documentation of it up. Um, give or take 1,100 LSUs thereabouts, 88 mil of rain. And in the paddock that those, so the cattle were in that paddock when it rained. So you can imagine it was like, it was like a yards. It was all churned up. There was black soil, top soil, everything, you know, all grass laid over into it. Um, clear running water through that entire paddock. Beautiful. So that's only, that, so that's all I can say on that is that it's just what I have visually seen and what we have documented on that, yes. Yeah, cool. So while I've got you interrupted, I have another question. Um, are you able to tell us what data you've had to collect for your LRF project? So it might be your, when you started off, you said something at baseline, but then also what other data have you been collecting along the way? Because this is things that people can go out to farmers and graziers now and say, get this stuff. So what have you collected? We've collected a lot, um, but the reason why we collected a lot is we wanted to highlight some inefficiencies within the system. Um, so to go back from the start, so we've had, we had Queensland Trust for Nature came out within this system and they set up and they showed um, a complete accounting for nature platform of what we have here. So we had a we had the Queensland Trust, for La uh, Queensland Trust for Nature ladies here and they were here for four or five days and they did a full ecology survey. Um, so they set up 15, uh, I can't remember exactly, but 15 sites. They went through, they have a protocol that they have to do at every site. 
and they went through and they collected as much information. They set up as much traps. We've had we had camera traps. We had hair traps, um, dung beetle traps. You know, they they tried to collect as much information as they could within that period of time. They went um, um, spotlighting at night, and that's where we found the old greater glider just here. Um, so we so within that survey, they did a lot, but they need to do a lot so that they can justify that back to LRF. We also went further. We went further with with RCS. We set up um, a loss of production base. So we have twenty two years of grazing data here. We can break that back down to our stock days per hectare. So there's there's a form that RCS have set up that um, stock days per hectare, 100 mils. So it's a way of measuring and comparing different land types compared to production and, and values and different things like that. Um, and then within that, we did that profit probe. So that last slide that was there, that was our 2019 figure. So we went through with profit probe to show the production that we can produce, um, tied that back to the, the history as well, uh, our other profit probes, tied that back to our SDHs per 100 mil. So if we were to lose production on our place, which we, which we will, going down a carbon credit, the more trees, that 40% mass that we've found does not seem to impact, impact our to 100% tree cover there's a loss of production going to be there. So we can justify what that loss of production will be. Um, and then, so we went to that extent for that because we really wanted to make this, to do a proper job on it so that it can highlight um, the strengths of the of the system and the weaknesses of the system. And we can have, we have a matrix now that was developed through the LRF pilot project with Bain and Co. And the matrix can sum up where roughly it needs to be to let a values need to be paid to land areas so that it's it all sort of it makes business sense. Um, and one of the reasons why that is just in this page right here now is it's you need to understand your agreement, but the second one it's needs to understand the implement implementations on land values so we had during that time we had um uh, we were changing banks so during the during the lrf pilot project time we were changing banks and the bank the new bank set out a person to to do land values and i had a chat with him um with regards to that and he said that the less production we have obviously the less value we have and then you know, so it then that impacts and then that reduces our land valuation. And that's the thing that I really wanted to get through to the LRF and to the Queensland government is that by putting these cover notes on properties, you're going to decrease the land value. So you're going to decrease our equity, our equity. But then within that, that takes it to a different level within the bank. So within the bank, if our risk increases, which it will with regards to, to having um changing covenant, changing lesson production. The bank actually said they would probably foreclose on us, um, even though we're a very profitable business, but purely, purely because our risk was too high. Um, so that's one of the things that I really wanted to get through to the LRF is how this implement, uh, how this will hurt the business. And it's not just mine, it's everyone else's, but it's the next generation. Um, excuse me. We're obviously very passionate there with succession planning and everyone who's coming through. Excuse me. Oh, well, um, well, it means that you care. And so we're actually listening because you do care and you're not saying flippant remarks. You're actually informing us really what it, ma what it means but also anyone else here can now say, yes, I was listening to this fella. He knew what he was talking about. He meant what he said. So, yeah, you can go and talk about um, facts and figures if you need to for a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what, that's what I need to do. Fact, family just messes my head up. Facts and figures is what I'm good at. 
So, so yes, yeah, so that's that. Um, so to go through, like, the areas that people need to investigate more, they need to really understand the agreement. And you need to talk to your solicitor, you need to talk to your account, you need to talk to your bank manager. Um, we've had bank manager, our old bank manager said, he said, I'm glad you had that conversation with me today because he said, if you had to sign that and went through that, he said, we may have full close on you purely. He said, yes, you're going to have more income. You're going you're gonna to be able to pay for it. But it come back to that risk. Our risk would have went too high and we were, we were shut down. Um, and then that's where that second point comes in where you need to understand your land values. And so... You know, by changing that carbon, by going through a biodiversity, by going through a carbon credit, it changes that covenant again, which then, which then reduces your production, which then reduces your land value, which then hurts you business-wise. So, you know, you need to understand these risks. You need to understand that stuff from the start. Um, you got to talk to your banks nearly every week, depending when you're going through it. The more knowledge you learn, the more knowledge the bank learns, because they look at your business from a different point of view. And honestly, it's just pure numbers. That's that's the only thing they look at your business at, is they have people in the back room that they go through, they do risk analysis, they do all this other stuff on you, and it's just pure number basis. And if your numbers hit a critical point, well, they'll kick you out the door and they'll cut their losses and go again. But And and that's what, and that, that comes back through on your interest rates and everything else as well. You know, then you've got to understand if you do go through the carbon, who carbon with a carbon provider, who takes the risk? Um, you know, a lot of it, you won't get paid for carbon if you don't, if you don't produce that carbon. So whilst they can go through and they can calculate it all out and they can give you this amazing figure, you don't get paid on that amazing figure. You actually, you only then get paid on what is produced. So if you have four or five dry years, so when they come out in four years' time, and even though they've calculated ease of maths, you know, even though they've calculated you're going to create a thousand ton over that period of time, you only produce 200 your ton because you've had four dry years. Well, they're only going to pay you on 400 ton. That's all you get paid on is what is actually what was grown in the paddock, you could say. Yeah, you know, and then you go through to the commission. So you're looking at paying possibly give or take 25 to 30 percent commission. And there's another tipping point there that I haven't got here that they want you to sign up for 100 years. So if you sign up for 100 years, you will get your full production. You'll get, you know, you'll get your 100% of your allocation. But if you sign up for 20 years, you lose 20% of that total figure at the start. You then lose 30% of your amount paid through, through commission. So you're looking at only earning possibly 50% of that figure. So... You've, this is where, I, back to the very first one, you need to understand your agreement. You need to go through and understand these figures. You've got to take those figures out. You've got to look at worst case scenario every single time because, you know, you've got to keep it real. You know, then you have your tax implications. So uh, carbon credits is deemed an off-farm income. So therefore, you're going to get taxed at a different rate compared to what you are. There's, there's, you can't average this on your on agriculture so you get taxed at a different rate and then the other thing though too that you could look at is is the change in management you know you do have to change something to go down this path of uh, of the carbon credit through the lrf so you got to actually go through and look at all the different management systems that you could implement and you got to figure out which one suits you the best um, not everybody's happy to have a system like us so we we shift cattle every day of the week. We shift cattle Christmas Day. So you've got to, if you want to go that intense, you have to, you have to do it. Um, you know, if you want to, if you don't want to go that intense, that's fine. But you've got to find something that you're happy to do that meets your lifestyle commitment that you would like. And then at the end there, who do you find? We, you've got to go find your own trusted advisors. You know, there are plenty of people out there that, that are great. And yet again, there's some people out there that are sharks. So, you know, you've got to be careful. You've got to have a broad knowledge. You can't, and I would honestly say, don't just talk to one carbon provider at the start. Talk to them all. Find out and, and use that time to build your knowledge and then 
you know, because everyone looks at it a different way. And then just come back to the ones that you are comfortable and happy to talk with. But through the whole process, you need to include your account and your solicitor because it's a signed contract. At the end of the day, it is a signed contract that you have to honour. Um, and you have to do your best to honour it because there are things there that if you don't do your certain part, you don't get paid. And that, that's fair enough. That's what it's got to be. But you just remember that first agreement, that first part is you need to understand your agreement and talk with your solicitor accountant and bank managers and then work through as a team to get it all through. Um, and the last slide here that my wife's done this up, this is what really helps her She's a visual learner. So during a good season, as you can see, you know, you have everything working for you. You've got your livestock, you've got your management improvements, you've got your seat, your carbon and tree soil carbon. You know, within that, I'd also throw in your biodiversity and things like that. Like, you know, once the system's working, um, it's pretty special to watch and to see. You know, and then you've got your co-benefits payment, which it all works together. You know, but then during your dry years, you know, your livestock, your production is way down on your livestock. That's okay because you're rain ready for that rain when it comes. So like that video, you know, after 235 mil rain, you know, then we received, well, I think we went up, that took us up to about 300 mil for rolling 12 months. You know, we had 12 to 18 inches of grass back again. So your country's rain ready, but as well during those dry years to help you destock, you have your, you have your other income coming in. You'll have your carbon income. And then you possibly also your, your co-benefit income as well to come in. So there is some great benefits for this. But at the same token, you just got to be really careful. You got to really understand it because it is a signed contract at the other at the end of the day that you have to honour those commitments. And um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Well, while people get busy typing questions, I do have one. Um, and and I suppose it's really for hopefully our audience. So what's something that NRM and the Ag Extension staff who are listening essentially, um, what's something that they can help people with to get to get started? So it might be something that you did have um, someone for FBA come out and work with you on, or it might be something you didn't realise that you needed help on and now it would be good for others. So is there something that that you'd give advice that if if they could get out and talk to farmers, what what would help? Yeah. Um, I think just they're, they're like, like most NRM groups have, have a reasonable understanding of some ecology type reports, systems, mm -hmm. you know, the different grasses, the different trees, the different bird lives, you know. So it's just by doing that. Um, one of the easiest things I have found to observe is the birds. Um, you know, we've had bird watchers here and I've gone with them and I've learnt and I've, I've spent time with them as through, through the week that they were here. So they were amazed that we have over 110 different species of birds here and that number's going up. And the number of, the pure number of birds is going up. Um, five years ago, we, we're lucky to see a red winged parrot. You know, certainly eight years ago, you would never have seen a red winged parrot. We have flocks flying around Coonabar at the moment. The, the red winged parrots, the, the rainbow lorikeets are back, the pale faced uh, rosellas are here, the double bars, the wrens, you know, uh, the different types of wrens. The, we've jabaroos are here, the, um, the plain turkeys, the, the plain, or we'll call them plain turkeys in case I mispronounce it. Um, you know, we had some guys here that they saw 13 or 14 in one flock. They have never seen that sort of number. So that's some of the simple stuff to look at. Um, these bird watchers, it was really interesting talking to them. He said, wherever they drive now, the main bird species they see are just the scavenger birds. Um, that's the main species that they see whenever they drive somewhere or, and look around. So, you know, it's, it's just really... It's just looking for birds and probably hearing them. And that's one of the things I didn't say is through that video is just listen to the birds. Like, you know, wherever we go, no matter what time of day it is, if you stop and turn the engine off, all you can do is hear is birds. You can hear birds across all of Coonabar. Um, so it's just looking for that. It's as well teaching them, you know, if they have the knowledge on koala scats uh, to possibly go out 
if they have some older ecosystem areas, possibly go out and look for, do some spotlighting at night, you know, to see what, see what they have in the trees. And it's something that you can do with your kids. Um, so we've gone out spotlighting with our kids. We've gone frog looking, you know, we've taken photos of frogs and we've sent them through to the Queensland Trust for Nature ladies. You know, they've been fantastic. Um, they've got, there's an app out, I think too, I don't know if you have to plug a, a microphone into your phone, but they can pick up the the birds, uh, not the birds, sorry, the bats, the frequency of the bats, and they can tell you what type of bat it is through the frequency that it was, the, the calls. So, you know, that, that's just some simple stuff that they can do before you get the Queensland Trust for Nature or before you get someone out to do a survey because surveys aren't cheap. You know, we had a company, I asked a company, approximately three, four years ago. Um, anyway, it worked out that they wanted over $200 an hour to do a survey. Yeah, so they wanted a twin, they wanted $20,000 for um, for two people here for two days. I think it was like it, it just knocked my socks off. Um, so I politely said, thank you, but no thank you. Um, I'll find a way that I can do this myself. And that's some of the simple ways to do it. Um, but then once you go into the carbon side, well, then you have to start talking to providers. You have to start talking to people who can do satellite imagery and, and measurements through through that. Um, but some of the stuff to, to save a lot of people a lot of time too, if they already have trees and the trees are over two metres tall, there's no point in them trying because that's one of the biggest sticking points we've had here is we, through the current methodologies, we are written out of nearly everything. Um, We've only cleared Coonabar once within the strips. We've cleared it a second time. Our trees are deemed too tall. Um, it deemed, we started our system in 92. Um, so they've deemed that we started our system too early. We have to, we still have to change our management practices. So even though we're not doing the normal, but we still have to go and change our grazing systems, put more fences in, change the densities, do something else. You know, so we're written out, as far as we're at the moment, we're written out of all those um, because we were an early adopter. We saw this early. We went with it. You know, those figures highlight the things that you can get through the production benefit. And that's, I suppose, that's the biggest thing for me is that the production benefit will always outweigh the carbon benefit. You know, yes, the carbon benefit's good and it helps get you payment. Um, it'll help supplement income and all the rest of it. But you've got to balance that up, you know, uh, against other things and other stuff. So, you know, and so personally for us, it didn't align because we we started too early. Um, I'm still looking. I'm still hoping there'll be a system out there that that we can be associated with, that we can be a part of. Um, the methodology hasn't come there yet, um, and I think I think mainly why we can't get it, as I've been told this all the time, is that we we're just too far in front of everyone else. So we've got to actually slow down. We've got to wait for people to catch up and then we might be able to find something that we can go in together. Um, but, in, you know, oh, we'll keep doing what we keep doing and we'll keep doing what we do and improving our knowledge and, and helping pass that on to other people. But, you know, it's that's some of the fight that I've found over the last oh, well, probably 18, two years really nearly since we started with the LRF project, but there's other systems there that, you know, I've been looking and learning about this stuff for eight to 10 years. Um, I've been waiting for something like this to come out, but yeah, unfortunately we, we seem to be written out of it at the moment, just through policy. Yeah. So what you're saying then, it sounds like um, your biodiversity co-benefits actually greater in drought because you provide a drought refuge. So I'm reading from the chat box there. It's a pretty good summary. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, it'd probably be right because, you know, so those birds, yeah, you know, um, ABC, that video was done, but I'm not on Facebook, um, but that video was done by ABC Capricornia. So if they wanted to look that up and watch that again, um, or if they wanted to share, I could just get that to you and share it again through them. But you, know, you listen to that bird life through that video. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And the other thing that does help with that is is yeah, water points that we've set up. So, you know, whilst they're not a natural water system, there is still water systems out there that the birds and the roos and everything else 
have access through. Um, and that was actually during the drive was when we found a cause because they actually they ran across in front of Dad on the motorbike when he was out shifting cattle one day. Before that, with their grass, you know, being so high, we can't, you know, we can't see them. Today, you, there's no chance in the world we'll be able to see them because the grass is, you know, four or five foot high. So you won't see a koala through that. So, yeah, but no, that's it's a very good summary. So as long as I've got time, Adam, I'm probably going to ask a big question and you have to somehow summarise it, Cameron. <laughs> um, so who helped you prepare your business case? Or like, so who helped... Um, what did you start with? Was it the RCS stuff or have you just, yeah, I don't know. Who helped you do that business case to make it worth it? Uh, lots of people, um, being honest. And I, you know, I get a question from over here and I get another question from there. So lots of people have sort of put, put ideas in my head. Um, and then I went to to Adam and, and George at RCS. And George has been one that's been doing a lot of the legwork at the moment. So he's the one that's um, talking to everyone and, and bringing all the figures in together. Um, but yeah, so no, it's, it was just through different things of going through the ARF project, you know, seeing the amount of tonnage of carbon that we have, going through the LRF project and seeing Queensland Trust for Nature coming out and seeing our our biodiversity, uh, our accounting for nature report, you know, through the LRF. So a lot, it would have come through the LRF project. So, you know, because that's when a lot of conversations and a lot of good conversations were had. So the LRF came up, um, Don Butler, Pam, Greet, and um, then, you know, so through that process we had uh, Green Fleet came up. RCS were there, Leanne Summer was there from WWFs, and then we had the, the three other, you know, myself and, and two other beef producers group, produ beef producer families there. It was through those conversations and, and through that, that project, that pilot project, that, you know, we got different parts of information from different bodies. And then I went to George and to Adam uh, Kiro at RCS and said, right, what can we do here? Look, look at this. How can we work? What can we work out here? And, you know, can we take yeah, our carbon credits today? Can we, can we work on a measurement of measuring what carbon we have within our trees and reverse engineering that back to when we started? You know, so that we can say that, because um, then you match that up with their grazing data that we have, 22 years of grazing data, you know, 25 years of rain records, you know, since we've been here. Yeah, so we've been on this journey for 28 years. So we started in 92, but, you know, we got serious in 97, 98. So it was just sort of through those conversations. And then, um, yeah, so through the LRF pilot project um, and then talking with RCS, you know, we've been associated with them for 28 years. So we have a, we have a pretty good rapport there. Um, and, yeah, we, we keep challenging each other um, every day of the week. Thank you, but uh, I think I should stop asking questions and leave it back to uh, Adam, who's chairing. Sorry, just looked at the time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Louise. And um, uh, you've asked some good questions, Louise, and, and some others. But um, yeah, thank you very much, Cameron, for today. I think it's it's been extremely valuable. Uh, obviously, you you know the passion, the journey you've been on. It's been a long journey, and it'll continue to be a journey. But um, yeah, I, your story really, um, you know, fascinates me and, and there's some more learnings out there and I hope uh, this webinar has been benefit to others on there and the fact that we've got it recorded too, I think um, we can we can push it on and, and keep keep your story alive and, and moving. So, um, yeah, so on behalf of myself, uh, Louise and Chris, uh, we'd like to thank you again for your time today. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank those also on the webinar for your time as well. Uh, and for those that are on the webinar, uh, you've seen today's webinar, um, it'll be up online shortly. But um, can, if you can uh, pass them to your colleagues within your organisations, that'd be great. So it gives them the opportunity too, because um, obviously some people can't make it today. And uh, it's a good story. So um, 
Yeah, just to wrap up, uh, we've, our final webinar is uh, on the 22nd of April, and we've got uh, John Connor from the Carbon Market Institute talking uh, to us there. And um, those uh, those are aware of John. He's um, yeah, he's 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 a good storyteller, but he's also full of information internationally and nationally about carbon. And so, please tune into that one and register for that because it, it'll be quite good. A good one to end on. But yeah, thanks again, Cameron. Really appreciate your time and thank you to everyone. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.